So appreciate everyone coming tonight. Uh, I'm one of the lab rep residents. I work for AFI. We produce software for uh, text analytics using linguistics. So we're involved in disclosure and e-discovery. And we're the co-hosts of Barclays. And on our panel tonight are four experts in many things. But tonight, they're going to talk about their expertise in disclosure and discovery. And the, on the panel to my left is Alex Keep. He's from the law firm Pinsent Masons, head of e-discovery. Carl Obai uh, from Pinsent, oh, sorry, oh, Pinsent Masons yes. from Rio Tinto. And he's head of forensics and e-discovery. And we have Megan Sauve from Special Counsel, head of e-discovery. And um, Zoe Davies, who's e-discovery manager at Barclays. And the idea is where each person will speak a little bit based on the questions I'm going to ask them. And we're going to have a free flow conversation. And we'll open it up to the floor at the end. And then the Christmas party will start. So again, thank you for, for joining us tonight. So I'm going to start with Alex. Um, we're talking about the, the new disclosure rules uh, that we'll pilot and the impact on, on disclosure and discovery. So Alex, for Pinsent, for a law firm, um, how does a pilot change your attitude to disclosure and the use of technology? Well, um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's a question we've been thinking about a lot internally at, um, at Pinson Masons. Um, we, have, um, we have a lot of experience and expertise regarding the different models of disclosure that are, that are now being proposed um, due to our experience in arbitration work. Um, I think an awful lot of what is being is going to be enacted is um, what people should have been considering as best practices for a number of years with regards to the previous disclosure rules. Um, there were options for disclosure um, that did not involve the typical standard disclosure that you know resulted in roomfuls of paralegals reviewing tens or hundreds of thousands of documents. Um, for no tangible purpose other than to prove that they're relevant or, or not relevant. Um, it's expensive, it's pointless, it's not what our clients want, it's not what, you know, it's worth remembering that the change to these rules did not come from law firms. The impetus behind this change came from the GC100, who said that, this w that the current disclosure rules were a waste of time and money. And I think um, the idea, some of the basic principles behind this are incredibly laudable. The idea of working together with the other side to actually get the best result for your client. It is very rare that if one side suffers in a large piece of litigation, the other side does not also suffer. Um, it's expense, you know, litigation is by its, com by its very nature complex and expensive. Um, if it wasn't, you know, if it wasn't, we wouldn't have law firms or most of us probably wouldn't have jobs. There's got to be, you know, money is the lifeblood of litigation. Um, that said, we as, we as a firm have recognized that this is a sea change and we have embarked um, on, a, on training our FIANAs to ensure that, um, ensure that they recognize the changes, that there will be a front loading of work and now we're, um, we have a panel of six, six companies and having spoken to our fee owners around the regions as well as in London, we're now going to each of our panel firms and we are speaking to them and we're saying what they think and how best we can work with them individually and collectively to ensure the best results for our clients <coughs> and the best, things that we, the best ways we can make this work principally for our clients. I mean, it's not really about us as a firm other than just doing things the best we can in order to um, in order to be the most professional and the most adroit at meeting the challenges that are that are coming but what do you have to do differently what, what we have to think about strategy Strat I think that's the thought a lot of people take instructions and they will just dive into the case um, one of my one of my one of the things I would say is whenever I, I speak to Fianna's or I mean, I've been in this industry for 22-ish years, and very often the first thing you'll hear from people is they'll say, oh, we've got this many gigabytes or this many terabytes, and this lot, you know, this is what we've got. And I say, well, that's great, but what's your case about? What do you want? Why are you actually looking at these documents? What is it? 
what do you want to get out of this? A lot of people just literally think it's a very linear process. Well, we get the documents, we bung it into Nukes, we bung it into Relativity, and then we might put a bit of TAR over the top, and then we'll, st we'll get the paralegals in. And that's not the way. That's not the way you should be thinking about it. What you should be thinking about is this is what my case is about. These are the points we need to prove. These are the points we need to disprove. And therefore, that's what we need from our documents. I mean, a point I, I constantly make to, any, to those people I'm consulting is the database is yours and your clients. Why are you, you know, why have you got it here? It's not a cheap thing to get involved in e disclosure. So therefore, you need to understand not just what you've got, that's a, that's a bill, that's a, that's a bottom line. Why have you got what you got and what are you trying to get out of it? That's the important thing. And what these rules do do is they make people have to think about that by early issue identification, by early ways of proving that, um, proving that issue or disproving it, and also by doing, by then allocating the most relevant and the most efficient and effective model to either prove or disprove that point. And we'll use technology differently to achieve the rules? Yes, I think <laughs> we will. I think, um, there, I think, I believe, I believe that products such as AFI um, will soon become the de facto way into which um, documents are processed into a law firm. I believe TAR 2.0 or TAR 3.0 when that comes along, or 4.0, or whatever it will be, Firms will respond to that first. There's case law to say you don't need to find absolutely any document that needs to be relevant. You have to find the majority and the key documents. And so um, thoughts like the initial disclosure, rules regarding initial disclosure, if you've got a case that's small enough and can meet those points, it's a great way of just proving your key bundle. I mean, I'm sure everyone in the audience here will, rem will be in cases where if you'd actually given the client an afternoon, and you said to them, "Can you just show your show everything that's really, really relevant to this case?" They could have gone through and gone, "Yep, there you are. There's there's two or three Libra Arch files of documents." And then you had to do the review for relevance, mm. and it cost God knows how much, and it involved God knows how much time. And if you'd actually just spoken to the key individuals and you'd said, "Where is this? What is this? That's really pertinent that you'll actually refer to in the trial." In the case, they, you know, you could have dispensed with this entire wasteful, costly process. Thank you, Alex. Carl, he's talking about wasting or costing a lot of time and money. <laughs> You're a corporation. You have a lot of losses. <coughs> How's a, how do the pilot, how the new rules impact? Uh, from uh, our, a corporate perspective, I fundamentally do not see the many benefits that the new directives brings on board. Uh, for one, there is uh, a rebuttable presumption that the stakeholders who actually should be responsible for ensuring that this is properly implemented understand technology. They do not. <laughs> Primarily, if you look at the substantive provision of the emergent rules, it is suggesting that what is utmost here is that lawyers have a considered conversation on how they can essentially reduce the volume of data that they're going to be dealing with in their cases. And to do that, they are encouraged to employ the use of technology, specifically artificial intelligence. What do the lawyers know about artificial intelligence? <laughs> it is a rebuttable presumption and one that is uh, grounded on very faulty grounds. Because if you're going to reduce the volume of data that you have from one terabyte, for example, to 30,000, it, uh, it involves a lot of nuance in terms of how you deploy that. And don't forget, in terms of litigation or even arbitration, you are dealing with someone on the opposite side. You are in a common law jurisdiction, so usually what you're going to be dealing with will be adversarial. When you go into a conference meeting to discuss how you're going to exchange document or the protocol or mechanism for achieving that, you're not going there to drink tea. 
<laughs> Forget what they tell you about, oh no, hold some considered friendly discussion. It's adversarial. I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you strategically. How can I take advantage of this guy? <laughs> and you are looking at me, I'm always smiling, but at the end of it, <laughs> it's just simply, how can I make life difficult for you so I can win my case? So, to do that, you really do need to understand that disclosure, discovery, is not a legal question per se. It is both a legal and technical question. So what that means, why I do not suggest that all lawyers or legally based individuals should be technologically concerned like myself, you need to bring someone into the room who understand the basic glossary, basic vocabulary of what digital data and e-discovery means. It is not enough to quote part 31 or tell me what the practice directive 31B is all about. When I go into a room on behalf of my client, on behalf of my company, it is a strategic meeting. If you are going to use AI, I will need to probe whether or not you understand what the species of AI you're going to deploy really means. You are going to let me know that that process can be validated and the integrity can be maintained. And what that entails is you need to understand the technology involved in the process. AI cannot be a black box. You cannot sit in front of me and just say, ah, oh, let us use technology, let us use computer to reduce the volume of data. I say, oh, that's nice. How are you going to do that? <laughs> I said, no, no, the rules say we can use technology. I understand that. I'm not quarreling with the rules now, but I need to ensure that the process you're going to employ is validated, the integrity is maintained, and the data or output that you're going to produce actually generates what is defensible. This is law. Whatever you're producing needs to be factually and empirically defensible. Can you tell me the process that your AI will adopt in doing all of this? I think we saw that in Triumph, though, this, the, the latest case reported. That, that was mm. the, the problem. It wasn't the use of the technology, but it was the fact that the law firm couldn't advocate and explain exactly. what they'd done and why they'd done it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. They weren't questioning the use of it, but it's understanding it and having a robust yeah. process yeah. We, that we you had, can explain. We had yes. a hearing yesterday where um, we, we dis described what we were doing to train the system and how we were slicing the documents up into, into issues to be able to train the documents, the, doc the AI selectively on the issues while the other side were proposing ju just dumping the whole lot in there and hoping for the best. Um, I mean, when I was many, many years ago, um, when I first started out in this industry in the mid-90s, um, it was when the first sort of Concordance 5, and God knows if anyone actually remembers all these sort of stuff, but, um, was first coming up. And um, I, was, I, I was working for a very large law firm at the time. And, I, and what would happen is that I'd have, I'd have sort of lawyers who I thought were quite smart, um, thought being up to. Now, I would then copy and paste the entire statements of case into the Boolean search window, and then press search, and then wonder why all the relevant documents weren't instantly appearing for them. And it's very much the same with these version, you know, with technology assisted review. You have to train the system. And I mean, from, from our point of view at Pinsel Masons, one of the key points is we have a hub. We have a specific set of specialists of, um, from around the firm who have all got experience of electronic document searching, electronic disclosure. And I am just, if you like, a product of the hub in that they've, they've taken, I, I've joined the firm. and. Prior to my joining, I made you know I understood what the firm's remit was, and that was to employ specific technologists to to best ensure that we can meet our clients' needs. So it's not as you as you quite rightly say, lawyers are not IT geeks. They don't get this. They really don't. And so what my role is, and what my key point, and what we have very successfully pushed out within the firm, we're not trying to we're not trying to host a system. We're not trying to by Relativity One, or you know, or <laughs> Open Text, or whoever else yeah. you know, we're not looking at that. What we're looking at is what are the what consultancy, what key advice can I give my clients, who are my who are fundamentally the fee earners, and then our clients, yeah. as ways to best pursue their interests and their case in the best way possible. Um, 
and 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 it's worked. And what we find is we have we have a panel of firms. They do our hosting. They do the actual grant work. We're not there to do that. We're not going to spend you know millions of pounds potentially on lots of people who are already you know when we've got ready-made experts who we can pick and choose. And if the technology becomes redundant overnight, we're not going to suddenly find we've wasted it at all. What we are going to do is we're going to hire the, you know, we're going to, to hire good people, hopefully, hopefully the best people, to advise our lawyers in the best way possible and then work with our clients and work, I, I agree, I agree. You're always looking at some That's a very good lead-in <laughs> for Megan yeah. to speak. Sure. <laughs> Megan works for service provider, a vendor providing discovery services, so. Well, that's yeah. exactly it. So you've got, you've got the law firm with their challenges and you know the holder of the data with their challenges and what should be happening under the pilot is you're bringing in an interpreter, right? Mm -hmm. You're bringing in somebody that can speak both languages. Um, so it's not enough to just have a, a button pusher or a person who's like very, you know, we own this great you know, algorithm. Okay, wh what can it do and is it purpose driven? And I feel like that's what the point of the pilot program is, um, is that you're using technology in a way that you're leveraging it in a purpose driven manner. So before, if we're using TAR, we're using TAR for the whole case, really? You know, some of our issues are easily dispensed with with a DT search. You know, why are we doing this? Why are we, why are we trying to make TAR do something that it's not going to be incredibly accurate for? People would say things like, oh, well, we're using TAR, so you can't use search terms. Well, that's crazy, because you have ran your TAR project, and it brought back a million of the same business documents because it's a word template. Every time we used it, it's back. You have to use search terms. So I feel like the pilot is saying, on these issues, look at the type of data, and apply the best approach. And we're going to hold you to that. Now, again, you know, Alex's firm obviously very much is interested in getting that out of us, you know, getting that out of the vendor. It's not okay for the vendor to just say, here's my technology, I'll take your instruction, you're responsible for whether or not tire works. You know, vendors need to be consultative and they need to be able to understand the, the needs of what has been agreed in court. Um, under the old rules, in a good project, that would happen anyways, right? This is best practice, that would happen anyways. Um, there would be cases where we've agreed to do this and we've said the budget is this, the data comes in and completely can't, you know, but we could amend what we've agreed with the other side. We could say, hey, you know, this could be solved with this piece of technology, but no, we're not going to do that. Okay, instead, the better thing to do is to throw a room full of paralegals at it for the next month to make it, because that's what we've agreed that that's that's a little bit silly so I feel like the pilot is by asking you on an issue by issue basis to make smart decisions on how to get it through it's going that you're exactly right the attorneys may not be able to understand how to leverage the technology but technology is constantly developing you know tar one whether we're using LSI or now we're using TAR2 and it's a Cal project, it's actively learning. Not just is it faster, not just is it, but is it more appropriate? Well, what type of decision are you trying to make here on the documents? And how granular do you need to be? Or are we just looking for the key ones? Because that's what we've agreed, right? So it, it all ties together and the point is to tie those three stakeholders together so that you can go into the meeting room and you know he doesn't <laughs> tear you a new one by not understanding what your algorithm is. <laughs> but how do you give a client, a client like Carl comfort that the AI delivered value? Oh, well, just by being a massive nerd, um, and so like, <laughs> that's just every time we're deploying. And no, anytime you're deploying a new technology, you're going to have people that understand it on a level where they're users. You're going to have people that understand how to look under the hood. And you're going to have people that understand how to communicate that. Um, and that's really something that the vendor needs to be able to provide for you. I've, I mean, just to answer that, I, I do think, I think you're absolutely right. I think the one, the one weakness that vendors have, and this is, it, this, is a, this is a necessary weakness in an odd way, is that 
vendors do not necessarily sit with the lawyers. They sit in their own office. Mm -hmm. They know their systems. They know their they know their procedures. They know and and they are and they have their methodology for working through it. What they don't know and what they can't possibly know are the pressures that the lawyers are under. And for that reason, it's imperative to have technologists within a law firm to be able to assist the vendors and say, even in a very huge, I mean, the strange thing is, something that's so technologically advanced, e-disclosure, e-discovery, is a, such a fundamentally human process. Mm -hmm. It's all about knowing the people and knowing how they work and knowing how they interrelate. And, um, and so as a result, you know, if you know that, oh, well, so-and-so is actually, actually under real time pressure on another case, or has a, you know, or the partner on the other case is actually biting their head off every two minutes. So give them a bit of a break and then ask them rather than, right. you know. That sort, of, that sort of very simple interaction on a very human level, or knowing how to explain something to one person because they get it and another person doesn't, it's not something that a vendor can give. But it is something that having an in-house technologist, having someone who is able to both soft soap but also meet the expectations of the firm and of the client to be able to explain what we're doing, which shouldn't be really the point of the vendor. The vendor should be explaining to the firm, and the firm should be explaining to the client. Yes, and exactly. That should, and, and that is key. Yeah, that is, you know, it, that's one of the things with vendors is when we build good working relationships with firms, it's partly because we, we know how to get out of their way, right? So that you can do, yeah. you know, there are so many times when um, this is objectively probably a true and right and, you know, natural decision, but we're pushing that pressure onto a law firm when they have to client manage their end client, you know, and hey, yeah, that might be right, but not going to happen, you know, or it, it, it's all a negotiation process mm. and those three points, aligning them on the same team is kind of, kind of the goal, I would assume, <laughs> is the goal. Um, yeah, Zoe, how about that? the yeah, so, I mean, impact of the pilot on Barclays? So. Yeah, I mean, I would say from Barclays' perspective, it's not really a, a change for us. Um, we contributed to the pilot through the working group um, and one of our panel law firms. And everything you're saying about in terms of partnering with the law firm, partnering with the vendor, we have panels and we work very closely with them, you know, over a period of time. So, like you say, we get to know, you know, one another. Um, like you say, you have a mix bag in, you know, in terms of even one law firm that you work with. What's the level of knowledge? Like you say, everything that you do needs to be defensible. But I think that's what this pilot is saying. You need to, you know, record your methodology so that if required, you can explain it. It's I think all this does really, and it's something that we've been doing for you know four plus years in the house at Barclays because we have that internal expertise. Is like you say, taking a step back at the start and thinking about your techno technology strategy, because like you say, it's the facts of the case and what do you need to prove or disprove. Mm. But what's the smartest way to do this? Because we have these technologies available, and we've certainly asked our panel law firms and you know with in conjunction with our vendors where they need that holding hand to really advocate the use of technology. Um, and you know, I think in the majority of our matters, we use AI in, in one way or another. Um, I think you know, we use Cal all the time, not just on large matters, you know, even if it's in terms of prioritization rather than the full model and cutting off. And, mm -hmm. you know, so we really get our law firms to advocate that process. We've always asked them you know, to speak with the other side and consult early on to say that you know we might be using certain technologies even if we don't quite know yet but put it on the table so that it's an option um, I think you know many things in the pilot for us it's just kind of re-emphasizing what our best practice has been for a few years mm -hmm. um, and the fact that we have these panel law firms and vendors you know our best practices are you know very much ingrained um, you know with both of those parties um, and we have a playbook that you know, often we have to deviate away from slightly, but there is sort of a best practice standard that all of us can sort of follow. And, you know, we do lean on vendors quite often that they might flag to us, hey, we're going a bit off piece here. You know, is this something that we want to do on this matter? You know, they can sort of help flag things to us. Mm -hmm. As you say, everybody's really busy. So, you know, I think the more that you can partner um, and realize that actually you need to do it in the most efficient and smart way, you know, if you work closely together, actually, 
different <coughs> people pick up on things first and can flag them and sort of bring it to our attention. But I think that's the difference with this pilot. It's now expected that you'll use technology rather than, you know, you can do it. Um, but that's some, certainly something that we've been advocating for, for many years internally now. Um, and, you know, we are very comfortable using and we expect our law firms to be comfortable using it and our panel, you know, vendors to consult with us, right. you know, on what the best strategies are. And like you say, it might not be using one type of technology, it might be a combination, you know, sometimes one is more appropriate than the other, so there's no sort of one-stop shop and we've certainly had to dispel the myth on, you know, certain tools, ECA tools, some lawyers seem to think that, you know, you put it in this machine and it will <coughs> tell you which are the relevant documents or which keywords yeah. you should run and, you know, so we've sort of had to dispel some myths in that sense as well, but I think that's, you know, the point of wherever they sit, whether it's in the corporate, the law firm, the vendor, using technology as the cases have got so much larger, that is yeah. now expected in the norm. So you need to make sure that expertise is somewhere so that you can, you know, record and defend your process, really. What if the, um, the panel firms are all using different technology? Do you yeah. use different firms based not only on the firm's expertise, but on the firm's technology that they use? Because you could have five firms using five different types of AI. So we kind of, uh, because we have the direct relationships with the e-discovery vendors, um, we sort of, right at the beginning within the corporate, we will look at, we say, what are the issues at hand, what data might be relevant, right from the beginning, that sort of scoping. So then we will think in advance, okay, these are all the vendors and the technologies available to us, which is going to be the most appropriate, because again, depending on your type of data, if there was one e-discovery tool, that was the best one and you know everybody would use that one but they kind of all have their strengths and weaknesses really and I think definitely in the corporate you know like ourselves we have different data types whether it you know obviously everyone does email but we have audio or chat data and you know they all have their you know complexities and you know sort of quirks as such so we think right at the beginning this is what I said I think the pilot really pushes that rather than oh this has happened and we need to go and collect everything and then like you say we'll just throw something at it and get you know the reviewers <laughs> in we kind of make everybody say, whoa, you know, stop. And right at the start, we will consider actually what do we think, sort of being slightly more experts in this area, where is it best place to go? Um, and then yes, where the sort of law firm sits within that, it might be that you know they are more comfortable with that technology that you're gonna go with, or, you know, so there's many sort of factors that play into it, um, let alone sort of what type of matter it is. But I think that is something that you know, large corporations or law firms like ourselves have been doing anyway. But I think this pilot is going to force others that aren't so knowledgeable to now start learning yeah. and considering that up front. So, can I, I mean, doing a sort of question, do you think there is a risk that um, the new pilot, particularly with regards to issues based disclosure and the different models, and um, I think there's no, I think everyone would agree there's going, there's going to be fragmentation, fragmentation of different tools. I mean, the hegemony of relativity is coming to an end. Different people are looking at different, different solutions way outside of, of that, as well as the different TAR 2.0 solutions. I mean, the big concern I see as someone looking slightly crystal ball gazing, but seeing potential issues in, in the future is that we're going to have this my toy is better than your toy approach. Yeah. On, <coughs> but not even on a case by case approach, but on an issue by issue mm -hmm. approach, whereby, um, you know, we were, ta I mean, we were talking before this began, we were talking about the awful drip feeding of correspondence that's completely wasteful unnecessary, and unnecessary under the current rules. Can you see that instead of that, we're just going to have a plethora of correspondence but it's all going to be, well, on this one, you should be using AFI, and on that one, you should be using Brainspace, or on this one, you know, there's going to be almost a, um, as I say, a toy box approach of my, you know, it, look at this, this is, this is right and yours is wrong, which is just going to replace a lot of the current arguments. It could potentially, I think, again, I think it's our responsibility almost to construct any sort of communications or potential back and forth, rather yeah. than, like, say, picking holes in the other mine is better than yours just to defend why yours might be different but it works it is sound it will get you the results so it might not be the same as yours but it works i think so i don't know i think it's part of we need to help 
drive that culture where it doesn't become that way? Well, I, th I think the, the best answer is not to, <laughs> is, is to, is to group the, the correspondents together and just say, look, here you go. If you really have a problem, let's discuss this at, at the DGH, and we'll yeah. take it from there. I mean, oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, from a from a vendor perspective, we've been in that position of you know justify why your algorithm's better than ours yeah. for a good five years now, right? Yeah. And the smart thing to be doing is you know the cooperative thing to be doing is to agree that most of the time you're going to get the same results either way if it's a tool that's performant and it's the gray doc the gray area documents that are oh, yeah. going, but. Ideally, at some point, you know, once we move past LSI or once we move past SVM, once we're looking at tools that are actually better model builders, yeah. are going to be tools that can deploy, deploy multiple analysis yes. at the same time. And that has that's existed in <coughs> statistical data mining hmm. since the 90s. You know, yeah. SAS Enterprise Miner did that. That was fine. Hmm. You know, so when can we start to apply that type of technology? And from a vendor perspective, a lot of vendors that are very much fighting these, my algorithm is better than your algorithm fights, uh, I, I would assume that's a losing strategy over the next five years. I would assume AI cost, is going yeah. to I mean, my thought is costs will actually. Mm. If you'll start getting adverse cost orders. If, yeah, they can't, exactly. if you can't find decent reasons for it, then expect yeah. to have an co adverse cost order yeah. against you. Exactly. Yeah, so from my perspective, I, I think the pilot itself has uh, imbued systemic failures, and th that is informed by the fact that in trying to pursue simplicity, they have in fact introduced complexity. If you move from just the question of basic disclosure to extended disclosure, which encompasses five different stages. The judge supposedly is in a good position to listen to arguments as to when you would move from one stage of the extended disclosure to the other. And what do we suspect that these arguments are going to be surrounding from lawyers? It will be involving things like, should we even be at this stage? I need stage three. The other guy says, no, we need stage one. Then the judge says, I think you should be doing stage five. Now, all of these arguments are not going to be legally isolated arguments. They are going to be surrounded by the primary question. We want to reduce the volume of data and subsequently reduce cost. We are in a technology hub. So I'd like to just uh, highlight some of the problems that we're going to confront here. When we talk of the algorithms that you are likely to be running with your AI, as programmers, you would recall that one of the very fundamental stuff that you protect is your code. Will you be willing to reveal how your code runs in deploying AI after you have compiled it? The answer will be a no, because it's proprietary. Moving away from that, your files may also be proprietary. The extensions are proprietary. I don't understand them. So there will be questions of whether or not we need to have a common ground as to what codes we are using to run AI. Do you see that happening? No. So there will be a lot of arguments in the terms of trying to cut cost. We are actually going to increase cost. There are going to be a lot of adjournments taken just to resolve these questions. And I see that was not bad enough. The guy who is supposed to adjudicate on all of this only knows how to use computers to send emails. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. So I think the, the, the process, especially in a pilot that requires five stages to reach some level of agreement which involve technical arguments, just does not make sense. And I, from my understanding, from my reading of it so far, it does not provide for special masters, as it were, to assist the courts. I, I only understand now they are just setting up a judicial institute for some judges to train the other judges. And we're talking about bringing this into play January 1st. Doesn't make sense to me. So forgive me if I'm not so excited. <laughs> I think, I mean, you've, you've picked up on one point which um, 
we were discussing just today, and that is the idea of parking disclosure costs early, early on, and not involving it in the present, initial precedent age. Um, the simple fact is your disclosure, if you don't have that initial idea of knowing, you know, a client who knows everything you've got, your disclosure will, to a greater or lesser extent, dictate your witness statements, your expert witnesses, and how you're going to treat what your core documents are, what your core document set is, and therefore how it's then treated. So to then say you can park disclosure as a, as a, as a sort of side, side point <laughs> without involving the rest of your case, because ultimately, in the vast majority of cases, your documents are your case. You know, the, whole, the reason why, um, why most detective series or whatever else rely on witnesses, it's always the witness in the witness box that you know, everyone looks at and it's not the document that someone's read, <laughs> is because it's dramatic and because it's easily led, because barristers can lead witnesses to a great or manipulate witnesses. And so the, I the idea that this can just be put to one side is, you know, it's a stuff of dreams. Yeah. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I, I, I think that, I, I believe me, I am not, I'm not the pilot's greatest you know, greatest proponent by any stretch of the imagination. I think there are a, a lot of. I think it could have been. I think it could have been unnecessary if we'd stuck with the old rules, properly implemented them, and allowed technology to catch up. Mm. But um, a little. Right, so you're not a proponent. He's not excited. But you, you, you contributed to the rules that you're you, you're, act, you're working through those rules for three years. Did, they, yeah. did your costs go up or down by using more technology? Down. Carl, they go down. If you use it properly, adequately, it should reduce cost. But to a very large extent, if you do not understand the nuance in its implementation, you are actually invariably going to increase cost. And my concern with the pilot scheme is that there is a presumption that technology is going to solve all of these problems. It will not. Because when you begin to talk about artificial intelligence, there is also the rebuttable presumption that it is perfect. It is not. What is artificial intelligence? It is a combination of a neural computation with mathematical algorithms. That's what is artificial intelligence. And because the neural aspect of it is coming from us human, what do you think we have done? We impute that imperfection from your codes into the process. Your codes are going to have bugs. They will require patches. So if you cannot tell me what your error rate is on your codes, why do you want me to accept your process I as that's validated? The, that's the point <coughs> that no human-led you know, matter or investigate will be perfect. And I don't think anybody is saying that the AI is perfect either. Yeah. But I guess definitely sitting within the corporate, you're saying everything is very cost-driven, let alone efficiencies just to make everybody's life easier. And the figures do speak for themselves. And I don't think anybody's trying to say that the process is perfect, but it certainly accelerates and helps. Yeah. Whether that's just because I think it helps you get to key facts and issues quicker and the understanding. And I completely agree with what you're saying in terms of it, can you explain it? Do you understand it? But to that granular detail, I think you can get your lawyers to understand it. I think you can get you know, at a CMC, the judge on board, you, I think this is what we were saying before, sort of pin it at the right level. Do yeah. they really need to know all of that? Like you said, they'll glaze over. They probably yeah. don't. But if you get that understanding and you can advocate that at the right <coughs> level, then actually it's just sort of accepted now. This is part of what he's doing to say that it is sort of standard. As long as you can explain it, I think at the correct level to that person, yeah. Not actually really. often now that, that that's the point we're seeing it in case or that there is that acceptance that is the like I'm, yeah that is the <coughs> point to it like if you were talking about accountancy nobody's going to go into an audit and explain how a calculator works right you're just going to check the math you know so similarly the results of what you're getting using the technology are going to speak for themselves a lot of times they do a lot of I times they do well, having having run I'll linear respond, review, yeah, yeah, but having run a linear review mm -hmm. versus a technology-backed one, and we do that standardly anyways, because we need to have a QC process that allows us to see if mm -hmm. our, re our attorneys are doing it. And 
running Cal in the background, even if you have a paralegal going, going through your documents, does give us a good steer in the right direction of whether the understanding is correct. Right? Every TAR project that goes wrong, it's usually down to a, you know, I didn't actually mean to code that relevant, mm. or I didn't have a good understanding of relevance, right. or the relevance, our idea of relevance has drifted from when we started. The computer helps you find these things a lot sooner and a lot faster than if you were trying to devise a search scheme and then search for what could have gone wrong. And I think that's the point. It's not to make the computer do it. It's to let the computer assist you with what you're trying uh, big to do. Point, big point I think people have to realize, which you, which you alluded to very well, is that ultimately, with the explosion of data, with the sheer volumes that we're looking at, and the exponential growth that, we're get, that we will be facing, we are facing, um, the idea of reviewing every document in a linear fashion is simply not going to work. Yeah. It doesn't work now. In you know, if you look twenty years in the future, I, I hate crystal ball gazing, but you know that twenty years in the future, the idea of doing a linear review of every document that's potentially relevant on a case would be laughed at. Well, I heard from Coca Cola. Like you shouldn't disclose. There shouldn't be an expectation to disclose every single exactly. just relevant yeah. document. That's yeah. what the different models are trying to mm. say, actually. Exactly. Just what are the issues? What are the key documents and facts that you need to find out? And as long as you, like I say, can prove, disprove, mm. you know, the key documents or the adverse ones are handed over, you don't need to find another 2,000 versions that just tell you stuff that you already know. Yes. Mind mm. you, the adverse point is well, probably one of the... <laughs> the known adverse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it is, I mean, it's what... It's kind of what we've been doing with linear review anyways, right? Your first pass review, here's a pool of what's probably relevant. Then somebody a little bit more intelligent, intelligent looks at it from what's needed, second pass, you know? And then your, your partner or your lead attorney on the case is gonna be like, okay, you know, you're just dropping that funnel down and now it's like, okay, but what are the 12 that I need to actually speak to my client about? You know, these are the, the key documents and a lot of what we're doing with natural language processing mm -hmm. does allow us to get there faster because it's allowing you to basically do like 900,000 iterations of a keyword search or, you know, seeing how language is used together. I think it's, it's very just tricky. I think if you yeah. just had, you know, if it was physical, a stack of documents or even if it's in a database now, mm -hmm. especially if it's some sort of investigation and you don't quite know who, what, you know, those ECA tools that use yeah. that technology, it, it gives that you a, a very high level overview and a visual way. And you might now see, oh, hey, you know, these people were talking or it was over this time period. And I think very quickly in yeah. those type of matters, that's where that can really... Get to the facts of the case, yeah. like as an exploration tool. would not find, you know, yeah. running keywords necessarily, or let's say whether it's in a database or physical, you would never sort of think where you pretty much know the key. Right. Those type of technologies definitely, at a high level, can show you the data in a way that you would just would never yep. see otherwise. I, I just wanted to. Wait, wait, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I just. We're gonna, you're going to be your open statement now. Yeah, okay. No one else is going to talk. We're going to open it to the floor. Oh. <laughs> Last one to you. You're going to answer a question. Sure, sure. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, just a quick one uh, to provide some clarification on the point of using computers. I don't think the substantive question is whether or not computers will aid is PD discovery of data, that's not the question. The question is, if you are using technology in an adversarial setting, where the other party needs to be convinced that what you're doing is in order, you need to understand your system. You need to understand what you're doing. Let's say we're, I'm using relativity, for example, you're using relativity, and we say, we've agreed that we're going to employ AI in doing all of this, car, for example, and I said, all right, run yours, I'm running mine. I get 70,000 documents. You come back to me and say, I have 30,000. I said, why? How did you reach that conclusion? You should have 70,000. The possible problem would be, you have set your hyperplane, what is relevant <coughs> and not relevant as a binary quotient. At 75, I have set my at 50 because that's convenient for me. We need to understand why that happened. So invariably, Lawyers cannot go into meetings and undertake obligations if you really do not understand how these things happen. 
while I do not suggest by any stretch of imagination, I'm a lawyer, but I'm also a techie. I don't expect everyone to be like me. But the point is, if you don't know, get someone in the room who knows. Yeah. It is not excusable that you sit right in front of me and I'm saying, what hyperplane did you use? So what do you mean by hyperplane? You should know. If you don't know, get a guy in here who knows. So my point is, admittedly, computers will assist because of their processing and resource powers to enhance this. But you need to understand what you're using. Don't take for granted you're going to walk into a conference and I'm going to accept all the stuff you're telling me. No, I'm going to take you off. I mean, the goal, I heard from Coca-Cola, is you don't want the legal bill to be bigger than the fine. <laughs> so we have to reduce the number of documents we're looking at because what's the point of going to court? I might as well just pay the fine. <laughs> now, audience, please, questions for our panel. I think you had a question earlier. Uh, I may have a comment. Comments. Uh, back to what Carl was saying. Yeah. I guess, um, just like if I'm a lawyer, uh, I'm a technical strategist, so I'm not to do with um, But just like you rely on the intelligence of the lawyers, some experts um, to decide on how to process uh, in general terms. You also obey a certain code, you, you obey certain rules, you design together rules to manage or to conduct a decision in process making. I guess maybe you are looking for the same thing when it comes to AI, to artificial intelligence. You need to have rules so you understand, like you're talking 50%, 75%. There needs to be a regulation when it comes to this other type of intelligence, which you do need because, as you have all said, it speeds up your process. It allows you to treat more data more efficiently. Um, so you need that, but maybe you need a little bit more regulation as to how you're going to use this. Because I understand from your perspective, it does look like a black box. Yeah. But as you all said, there are experts that can help you and constitute the panel to help you design those rules so that agree and, and move forward more efficiently altogether. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd suggest the first thing, these, these rules are to make people use technology assisted review to actually solve the problem we see, we're all seeing, we're all recognizing is in our industry and, uh, you know, basically one of the reasons we're all here tonight. The next set of rules, the next iteration or the iteration after will refine those down and start saying, you should therefore, if you're going to do this, then there should be a minimum ex, you know, expectancy of what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. This, this is just to say this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. The next set of rules will be, the, will be where they start saying, and this, is, you know, and this defines it. Yeah. And I think you know, we've got to, TAR 2.0 is in its infancy. TAR 1.0 is still quite young. It's, you know, there's still there's going to be TR three and TR four and whatever. I think and it's almost the point that you've got to be careful if you do mm. get into specifics and write that in. It yeah. needs to allow for the technology oh, to absolutely. evolve. But there'll have to be yeah. guidelines, exactly. is what I'm saying. Well, and that's when the, and at the moment they're just saying use TAR, which is a good start. Yeah, there is there is another difficulty though is and especially if you're putting it in lawyer hands. Oh, we need to agree on what our you know protocol mm -hmm. is, and we hear that a lot. What's your tire protocol? What's you know. A lot of times, if you're too prescriptive mm. in your tower protocol or how you're going to handle it, it doesn't really allow you to carve out what's throwing it off, right? So, oh, we're going to do six rounds of sampling, 1,500, boom, we're going to get a result. That isn't going to get you there, except in, it, that's the ideal scenario. You know, if you're, if you're looking at a confidence interval, if you're looking at a margin of error, if the data set cannot make those distinctions to that level of certainty, how do we explore that gray area and pull it back? Mm -hmm. And how do we have somebody supervising that project that can help you get there faster? So you're not doing, and that was part of the problem with TAR, is round after round after why that is. And you, that's why you need somebody who understands the math. You need somebody who can explore the data. You know, you will need a little bit more of a data analyst approach. And yes, it's great to agree to a TAR protocol, but it's also great to agree to modify it once we're dealing with actual data. That's just, just a quick crucial. one. Uh, my, my response is this. You cannot legislate everything. <laughs> because essentially, we're in a technology hub. When you develop AI, 
the code with which you're developing your AI may be C++. I wrote mine in Python. Mm -hmm. The other guy wrote theirs in Java. The other guy there wrote theirs in XML, some very strange programming language. The courts and the law cannot legislate for a universal code to produce AI. That's not possible. If I may, you're speaking to me in English. I could speak to you in Spanish. We yeah. could translate. Yes. We can use different language. I think as long as we agree on the process, the rules and regulation, we can find a way forward. I like the way you use the word rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Who would enact the rules and regulation? Can you imagine a consortium of legal and, and technological specialists? These guys. I mean, you, can't, you can't do it by yourself. They can't do it by <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why I think that the, the pilot and even the existing uh, civil procedure rules, Part 31 encourages lawyers to ensure that they talk to each other prior to actually implementing disclosure and discovery activities. That's the point. They have to talk. But you're asking people to talk who do not understand the technology. Because there is a little line on there of don't just talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> talk to somebody who, yeah. who knows Absolutely. a little bit about how that's going to work. Because that's that's exactly what happens you've mm. talked to each other you've agreed on something and now we're like you, you know that's all excel files right that's never gonna work <laughs> like that doesn't happen let's throw this technology at it yeah we're reaching the conclusion we have time for one question or no question we thank everybody and we start partying oh. <laughs> Just to thank again Zoe from Barclays, Megan from Special Counsel, Carl from Rio Tinto. Thank you. And Alex from Pinta Mesa. So Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. I think that round of applause means that everybody's now ready for party. <laughs> 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 oh, or, 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 or,